age, uh, like alcohols. Um, and obviously, as we talked about how to name alcohols, um, pretty much you put OL at the end. We do give the location as to where we could find the OH group uh, when there's kind of three or more carbons involved. Uh, the OH group does take the priority in terms of naming. So everything else that's there is named accordingly. Um, we also talked about some reactions involving alcohols, how to make an alcohol. Uh, we saw a couple of times. So again, if you take an alkene, which is double bond, and uh, you add water to it, you'll make an alcohol. You can also dehydrate an alcohol, which is the reverse reaction where we take away water and we basically will get that double bond. And <clears throat> we also saw some oxidations of alcohol. So primary alcohol will oxidize to an aldehyde. A secondary alcohol will uh, oxidize to a ketone. While that tertiary alcohol will not oxidize, again, it is missing uh, that extra H that's needed for the oxidation to occur. Uh, we also uh, finished up talking about another group that's very similar to alcohols, which is the thiols. Uh, thiols have a functional group of SH. Um, again, it doesn't have the ability to hydrogen bond um, like uh, alcohol does with its OH group. So it does have a lower boiling point than alcohols in that particular case. Uh, as we talked about last time, you don't need to know how to name thiols, but you do need to recognize it as a thiol. So again, that SH group is how you recognize it. And to name it, as we just talked a little bit about there towards the very end, uh, basically, you take the longest carbon chain, like you see on the right there, which is two, and that's ethane, and then you pretty much put thiol at the end of it, and that is the way that you name it. But again, um, we're not going to really uh, have to worry about naming it or anything like that. In terms of the exam, we'll talk about that towards the end, but I, I don't believe the exam will be next week. So we'll talk about when it will be um, towards the end of lecture and stuff like that to see where we're at. Okay, uh, so continuing on sort of where we left off, uh, which is our thiols here. Um, thiols do go undergo a, a specific type of reaction that you do need to know about. And they can be, they can go underneath a, or undergo a oxidation reaction. And when you have two thiols, so for example, if we have this thiol here, um, <clears throat> and if we actually just draw each of these out here, uh, so, we basically have this, we have, actually we'll draw it this way. We'll draw just this part of it out. And we have the S and the H. And we basically have two of them. So we have an identical one happening right next door. So I'll draw that one out as well. And what happens in this reaction, which is an oxidation reaction, so remember when you see that kind of little O with the brackets around it on top of the arrow, that means that this guy is going through an oxidation reaction. And the oxidation reaction that we see here is the same oxidation definition that we saw with the alcohols, which is basically the loss of H2. So what ends up happening when two thiols come together in an oxidation reaction is the two hydrogens, one from each of them, is basically what is lost. And when that happens, we form H2. And then what we form in terms of the product is essentially you could start on the left-hand side, and go all the way to the right-hand side, and connect everybody. Just take out, uh, obviously, the two Hs. So if you were to do that, if you started on sort of the left-hand side and went to the right-hand side, if you drew everything out, you would end up with, we have that CH3 group there on the left. We then have a CH group. We then have a sulfur, which takes us up to here. Again, this part of it gets removed. So we pick back up on the other side with that S. And then everything else remains exactly the same on the back end of this reaction. So an oxidation of two thiols we'll make this bond here. And this bond right here is what is sometimes referred to as a disulfide bond. What is sometimes referred to as a disulfide bond or sometimes a disulfide bridge is referred to. And it's basically two sulfurs to come together 
They're important in a number of things, including in a later chapter, we'll see uh, when we talk about amino acids. Uh, there's a couple, or there's a, an amino acid that has sulfur in it and part of sort of proteins and those type of things when they come together, they tend to form a lot of disulfide bridges when these two guys come together. So if you take a thiol and you oxidize it, you basically are just gonna remove the two H's. And sometimes it's a lot easier if you kind of draw them like I did where you have an SH group in the first one and then you start with the SH group in the second one and kind of line both of those guys up that way. And then you essentially just take out the H2 and continue down the road there and uh, pretty much put everything in place there. And again, makes that disulfide bond or disulfide bridge. Now that's the oxidation reaction. You then could take a disulfide bond or bridge and you can break it up by doing the reduction reaction. So remember that the reduction reaction is the basically opposite of the oxidation reaction. So in this one, which is our reduction reaction, which is sometimes abbreviated with the H in parentheses, our brackets, and that means reduction. And here it's actually gonna mean a gaining of H2. So basically same idea if you were to approach this guy, you could draw it out if you like. And this is the guy we just started with, I believe. And when you do a reduction of these guys that are together here in this disulfide bond, it will always break right there. So it's always gonna break right there between the two S's. And then pretty much the guy on the left stays the same guy on the right here stays the same the only addition is you're going to put an h at the end so we'll end up with again it looks identical absolutely nothing else changes this is identical to what we have on the left hand side there and again we're going to add the h back in and then we obviously would add the h to the next guy and everybody else would be exactly the same as well for that guy and we get our two thiols back in this particular case. So if you take two thiols and you oxidize them, you get them basically coming together. They make this disulfide bond. And if you wanna break them back apart, you put the H2 back in, which is basically what is referred to as the reduction reaction that's going to happen. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> And like I said before, uh, we'll see this a little bit more in a later chapter as well. Um, again, a lot of amino acids or a couple, actually one amino acid that has basically a thiol on it. And you can see these are kind of amino acids here and they will make these disulfide bridges here or bonds between the different amino acids. You can see this kind of causes some curling of it as well and the current uh, that's happening in terms of the uh, chain. So to review for thiols, you need to be able to recognize the functional group as SH. You need to be able to uh, do the oxidation reaction, the reduction reaction as well um, in terms of thiols. Again, you don't have to name thiols for us, but you do have to be able to recognize them. Any questions on that? Okay, then let's talk about then aldehydes and ketones. So two important sort of groups that contain this carbon oxygen double bond are our aldehydes and our ketones. The aldehydes have the functional group of carbon oxygen double bond and hydrogen. And ketones, again, as I've mentioned a few times, is basically a three carbon run in a row where the center carbon has that carbon L carbon and has that double bonded to the oxygen. So aldehydes and ketones, also, uh, um, yeah, we'll talk about that later, I think. All right, so the carbonyl carbon, as we talked about earlier, which is this carbon oxygen double bond, and again, that uh, carbon is this guy, has the one, two, and again, double bond counts as only one electron pair. So it basically has three electron pairs and it has three bonds. Uh, which is basically our trigonal planar geometry here. So by having that sort of carbon oxygen happening here, we have that trigonal planar geometry, which is more like that triangle geometry here, that 120 degrees. This part of it here is polar, 
where the oxygen is more negative and the carbon is more positive. So that little group there, that carbonyl carbon with the carbon oxygen double bond is a polar group. There is some separation of charge and it is important in terms of how some reactions do occur. So aldehydes in terms of naming is pretty straightforward here. We want to look for the longest continuous carbon chain, pretty much like everything else. It does have to contain the functional group. And because this is the functional group of an aldehyde, and because there is a hydrogen here, it will always be at the end. So this functional group will always find itself at the end. It might be the left-hand side, right-hand side, whichever end, but it will always find itself there at the end. So in this case, we have uh, one, two, three, four carbons. Four carbons based off of butane. And for our aldehyde, we replace the last part with AL. So not OL like alcohols, but AL uh, for our aldehydes. And that would be butanal, AL. We do not have to give the location of where this functional group is because that hydrogen is there. It will always be at the end. So wherever this group is, wherever the carbon oxygen double bond is, that always is going to be carbon number one for numbering. So it should always get the lowest number. So whichever side it's on, left side, right side, will always be carbon number one. Everybody else will be numbered accordingly. So we can see at carbon two and carbon three, we have a methyl group and a methyl group. So that is our two, three dimethyl butanal. So aldehyde is pretty straightforward, longest continuous carbon chain that has that aldehyde group on it, that aldehyde group there will be carbon number one. Every other else that's there will be named accordingly based on its location. Question on that there. <clears throat> now, oops, aldehydes, there are some that have some common names. Uh, for us, a couple of these you should be aware of. This one right here, this is one carbon, uh, which is based off of methane. We'll drop the E and it becomes methanal, A-L. Methanal, which is one carbon, is also known as formaldehyde. Yes, but they use to keep everything intact there. Uh, this guy as well, this is one, two carbons, uh, which is based off of ethane. Drop the E, ethanal, A-L. Also known as acetaldehyde is another common name for it. And this one here, which is our benzene ring. And here uh, we would uh, call it benzaldehyde here. Again, the aldehyde group is here. So this is a common name that's usually used. Kind of drop the last part of benzene and put aldehyde on it. So benzaldehyde here and formaldehyde. So I would say for us, probably formaldehyde will show up probably a lot. And also this name is very commonly used um, in terms of it because of the benzene ring. So those two you should, probably should be familiar with. But the first two, again, you could go uh, uh, methanol and ethanol, which is sort of the IUPAC way of naming. Now ketones are a little bit different. We are looking for the longest continuous carbon chain. Again, it does need to have the ketone group in it. And here, if we look at it in the box, we got one, two, three, four, five carbons, five carbons, again, based off of pentane. Ketones end in O-N-E at the end of it. So we drop the E like we see here, put the O-N-E. So that is pentanone. Unlike aldehydes, the ketone group will never, functional group will never be at the end because you always need a three carbon run which means that carbon oxygen double bond will never find itself at the end carbon. So you do need to give the location usually right around four or more carbons is where that occurs. But what we want to do is we want to give that carbon oxygen the smallest number. So if we went left to right here, we have one and two. Obviously, if we numbered the other way, one, two, three, four, and five. That would give the carbon oxygen a larger number, which we would not want. 
So we would want a number left to right, and that's what the two here in the name is for. So two pentanone means we have a ketone, and at carbon number two is where the carbon oxygen double bond is located. And the only other group that we would have on this particular one here is a methyl group at carbon number three. So this is three methyl. I feel like I missed the letter there. Let's try that again. Methyl, just missing the Y. Three methyl, two pentanone in this case would be the proper way. So in the case of ketones, you typically do have to sort of give uh, the location of the carbon oxygen double bond. And then whichever way gives that carbon oxygen double bond the smallest number is the way you should go. And everybody else would be accordingly, uh, you know, numbered accordingly to that question on that one there. Now, if we have uh, a ketone in sort of a ring type structure, uh, we do a very similar thing to oops, uh, what we've done before. So really this here is cyclohexane. Again, this up here is our ketone group. And in case you can't see it, that's a carbon, that's a carbon, and that's a carbon. So that is three carbons in a row with the oxygen double bond on the center carbon. And that became cyclohexanone. And then obviously we have an ethyl group that's there. And we also have a methyl group where we need to give some locations. Um, the ring is then numbered counterclockwise or clockwise to give the first group the lowest number. So we wanna go whichever way we'll do that. So if we just checked it here, one, two, three, four, five, six. So going clockwise, we have three and four. If we went counterclockwise, one, two, three, four, five, and six, uh, we would end up with four and five in this case in terms of the numbers. So we probably would wanna go clockwise in terms of our naming, our numbering, so that we end up with the smaller numbers in this particular case. And that's what we see here again, going clockwise gives our groups that three, four numbering, alphabetical like normal. So three ethyl, four methyl, cyclohexanone. Again, no need for the number in a ring because this carbon is always going to be carbon number one, no matter where it's located. Question on that there. Again, here we wouldn't go counterclockwise because it gives our groups whatever we had there, four and five in terms of the number. And again, that's a higher number and we always want lower numbers. Any questions on that there? All right, a couple of ketones that have common names. Uh, this is one, two, three, which is propanone, two propanone. And again, it's also known as acetone. Uh, so this kind of arrangement here. Uh, these are a couple of other ones, probably not as common uh, you'll come across here. This is acetophenone here. Um, <clears throat> you might even see a benzyl ketone as a common way of naming it as well. So for out of this list, I would say acetone is one that comes across a lot. So make sure you sort of recognize acetone. It's really kind of like two propanone there. So why don't you try some here? Why don't you name each of these? So take a couple of minutes here and name these guys. Things are a little bit off in terms of where it goes. So let's kind of fix it. Oxygen obviously goes here. And on my screen, it looks a little cut off. So I'll redraw the bottom one there for you um, in terms of what we got going on. <clears throat> Uh, let's see here, one, two, three, four. So the bottom one should look like this here. There you go. And the rest I think is okay.
Okay, so let's take a look and see. So again, I got, uh, first off, I want to identify what it is. So I see this group here at the end. That automatically tells me this is an aldehyde. And we want the longest carbon chain with that. So that is one, two, three, four, and five. And that is based off of pentane. And since it becomes a aldehyde, it ends in AL. So this is pentanal. Again, no need to give the location of that group because it always has to be at the end. And this would always obviously be carbon one if we needed to do any type of numbering. Any questions on that particular one there? We see uh, same thing if we look at the second one, we see the aldehyde group. Carbon is one, two, and three. Not a carbon here, that's actually a chlorine. So we do have one, two, three. Three carbons, which is based off of propane, uh, becomes propanal, AL. Now, this is, has to be carbon one, where that carbon-oxygen double bond is located. This would be carbon two, carbon three, and that means that my chlorine group there is at carbon three. So this would be three chloral uh, propanal. Any questions on that particular one there? Coming here, hopefully you could recognize it, but here is one carbon, two carbons, three carbons in a row with a carbon oxygen double bond on the center carbon. And that is our ketone group there. So our ketone group, we're looking for the longest carbon chain, which is one, two, three, and four carbons. I'll just go up here. Four carbons is based off of butane. This becomes butanone, O-N-E. We do need to give the location of that carbon oxygen double bond. So that is one, two, three, four. Opposite way would give one, two, three, four. So numbering right to left would give the carbon oxygen the smaller number. So that would be two butanone would be it again, the two for the location of this carbon oxygen double bond. Any questions on any of those names there? So take a couple of minutes here and come up with uh, some names here and see what you come up with. Okay, so looking at the first one here, again, uh, looking to see what type of guy it is. That is three carbons in a row. That has a carbon oxygen double bond on the center. So again, this is our ketone group here. So we got one, two, three, four, five carbons with a ketone. That is gonna be pentanone, O-N-E. Again, we wanna give this guy the smallest number and that's gonna be achieved by going right to left in terms of our numbering. So this would be two pentanone. Again, there's no other groups there, but if there was, everybody else would be on the appropriate carbon based on how we number that guy. Coming to B here, uh, we have basically a cyclohexane ring here. 
it is one carbon there, two carbons there, and three carbons there. So that is three carbons with our center carbon having that double bond, and that is a ketone. So it becomes cyclo. Let me try to spell again. Let me try it again. Cyclohexanone. There we go. Cyclohexanone would be that guy in B. Again, no need to give the location because it is always going to be carbon one. So this carbon right here, always going to be carbon one. And then, you know, if you had other groups, you need to determine which way gives those groups the smaller number. Any question on those first two? Coming here, we hopefully can recognize our aldehyde group here. So we have our aldehyde group at the end. Longest carbon chain, one, two, three, four. You could get that a couple of different ways. You could start at the bottom and go up and over. It gives you four. Start up here at top to go down and over. It gives you four. Um, so four is the longest continuous chain. Again, might as well just go the straight part there. So four carbons with an aldehyde group going to turn this into butanal, AL. Again, do not need the location of this guy because it's an aldehyde, but it is going to be carbon one, no matter what. So this would be carbon two, this would be carbon three, and that would be carbon four. And we see at carbon number three, we have two methyl groups. So this is going to be three comma three dimethyl butanal. So three comma three dash dimethyl butanal would be the name. Any questions on any of those names there? Okay, so let's make sure we could also draw it. So here's a few, draw the uh, pictures for each of these or the formulas or the structure, I guess is a better way of writing that.
Okay, so when we draw these guys like normal, we're going to kind of work our way backwards. And remember, it's almost easier to draw these things from the name. So when we see penta now, first off, the penta part uh, does mean that we have five carbons. So we'll start with that. Al means that we have basically our aldehyde group there. And since you are drawing it, you could put it at either end. Give me a little bit more room here. So again, we have our five carbons. I'm gonna put my aldehyde group, which is the carbon oxygen double bond and hydrogen at the end here. Now that takes care of this part of the name. We then know that this is gonna be carbon one. This will be two. This would be three, this would be four, which means I should have a methyl group located there. That takes care of that part. Now the rest of it, like normal, is going to be hydrogens to give carbon four bonds. So the first uh, carbon on the right has enough bonds. Second carbon needs two hydrogens. Third carbon needs two. Fourth carbon needs one. Carbon at the end needs three. So it looks something like this here. It would not. So if your question is, uh, if your question is, could you have drawn it like this? I was going to go above it, right on the rim there, and uh, we'll go this way. Uh, if you drew it like this, perfectly fine. It's no, not a problem. Again, in this case, this would be carbon one. This would be carbon two, carbon three, carbon four. And there's my methyl group for this guy here attached at carbon number four. So either way is fine. Again, since you're drawing it, uh, you have the choice as to which way you do it. Again, though, whichever side you put it on, it should either be on one side or the other. Wherever you put that guy, this has to always be carbon one, though. So that's the important part of it. For everybody else that may be attached, it's got to be carbon one. Other questions on that? Okay, so same idea heading uh, this way. Uh, we got propanol. Again, uh, the prop part there, propane, is going to tell us that is three carbons. The AL part, again, going to tell us it's an aldehyde. And again, as the earlier question, you could put it on the right-hand side, you could put it on the left-hand side. I will again just put it on the right hand side. That takes care of this. Since I put mine on the right hand side, that's going to be carbon number one for me. This will be carbon two. This would be carbon three. And we see that we have two chlorines, one at carbon two and one at carbon three. And at this point, again, everything else is going to be hydrogen to get carbon to four. Uh, so this guy needs just one. This guy needs a couple in this particular case. Any questions on that particular one there? And lastly, we have uh, butanone. So the butane part is four carbons. So that's what we'll start with. O-N-E means that it is a ketone and the carbon oxygen double bond is at carbon number two. Again, because you're drawing it, you do have the option. I'm going to put mine right here. You could have put it, you know, going the other way. Because I put it there, that means for me, this is carbon one. This would be carbon two. That would be carbon three. That would be carbon four. And for me, that means that carbon three, I would have my methyl group located there and again here everybody else would be a hydrogen to get us to four so if we do that needs three needs one needs none and needs three and again you absolutely could have if you wanted to uh kind of drew it the opposite way there um we would have let's see double bond o and our CH, CH3, and our CH3. 
three in this case. So he could have done this as well. Either one would have been perfectly fine. Um, again, because you're drawing it, you do have sort of that option as well. Get that out of the way so we can kind of see the first one as well. Any questions on how to draw ketones, draw aldehydes? Technically, what I just drew and all these would be the condensed formula. Again, none of the hydrogens are really sort of drawn out. If you wanted really the structural formula, like I said, probably should draw all the hydrogens out and stuff like that. Um, by the way, if you had, uh, if you wanted to see what it looked like in a line formula, it would look something like this and something like this. So this would be this, by the way. Again, that would be one carbon, two carbons, three carbons, four carbons, and a CH3 group at the end, basically. So remember, line structure, we typically don't draw everything out, but it would look something like this as well. Any questions on that? All right, so just to finish up here about these guys, uh, some physical properties, aldehydes and ketones, uh, they typically do have higher boiling points uh, than hydrocarbons. Uh, that's because they're polar molecules. So they, they can't really hydrogen bond here uh, with themselves, but they do have that polar group here Uh, that gives them the ability to do a little bit dipole-dipole. It also gives them the ability to allow it to hydrogen bond with something else. Uh, so we do see a little bit stronger boiling points here than we do with our alkanes, which have no ability to hydrogen bond, aren't really polar molecules as well. But they do have still lower boiling points than our alcohols. So remember, our alcohols are sort of our best in terms of those things. Again, our alcohols have the OH group, which allows them to hydrogen bond. That is a very strong intermolecular force. So it is going to be stronger than our ketones and our aldehydes here. So our alcohol still wins in terms of boiling point. Uh, you can see ketones are below that and aldehydes also sort of in the same realm here uh, as well. Again, the aldehydes and ketones have that ability to do a little bit of interaction there. Uh, but definitely nowhere near as strong as something uh, that can hydrogen bond. So aldehydes and ketones, they are soluble in organic solvents. Uh, if you have some that are small as well, they are going to be soluble in water. And again, although they cannot hydrogen bond with themselves, because they do have that carbon oxygen part, which is more positive, more negative, when water comes by, which is also negative and positive, it gives them a place to interact with each other. I guess I should do that to the hydrogen it would have been better there instead of the plus sign. So it can hydrogen bond with water and it does make them relatively soluble because of this carbonyl carbon basically interacting with water through hydrogen bonding. But much like most organic guys, if you start building out a lot more carbons, solubility pretty much goes down to nothing. Uh, again, it's just a process of as you build out a ton of more carbons, thing is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And it makes this one little small part where it can interact with water a lot harder for the water to get in there and sort of interact. Because remember on all these carbons, you got hydrogen sort of in the way. Again, it's sometimes referred to as steric hindrance, fancy word for basically the thing gets in the way of it being able to interact really well. But about six or less carbons, you'll see ketones, uh, you'll see some aldehydes being fairly soluble in water. Again, though, larger than that, it gets in its way basically. Some uh, aldehydes uh, are major components in certain things like cinnamon here. There's cinaldehyde, whoops. And this is also sometimes how that aldehyde group is written. So if you see something written like this, CHO, that is the aldehyde group and sort of shorthand. So you'll sometimes see that guy there. Uh, so it's basically a benzene ring with a couple other guys here, cinnamon, here's vanilla as well. Again, here we have that basic carbon, oxygen, hydrogen 
that's basically attached here at the end, which would be our aldehyde group. Uh, here's a, here's a, another aldehyde as well, uh, centronella candles and so forth. Obviously, all these things have some smells, right? So a lot of aldehydes do have certain smells associated with them, like cinnamon, for example, and so forth. Now let's talk about some reactions that aldehydes undergo. So aldehydes will oxidize. And if you remember, as we talked about before, how we get ourselves to the aldehyde in the first place is to take a primary alcohol. So if we take a primary alcohol, and oxidize it, we end up with our aldehyde. This primary alcohol is oxidized by losing H2. So we lose H2 as we talked about. So when we go through and oxidize it one more time, what we actually get is an inserting of oxygen here. And remember that the gaining of oxygen is another definition of oxidation. And basically nothing changes other than we get this OH group here. And we make what is known as a carboxylic acid. Carboxylic acid has the functional group of carbon, oxygen, double bond, and OH. And it's sometimes abbreviated COOH in formulas. And that's a carboxylic acid group. So if we take an aldehyde, we can make it by taking a primary alcohol and oxidizing it to an aldehyde. We then can oxidize it one more time and we will get a carboxylic acid here that has this functional group. And again, really nothing changes other than, you know, we insert basically the oxygen there. So you can have, like we see here, this is our aldehyde. This is gonna help us go through an oxidation reaction, which is a catalyst to help it oxidize. And everything remains the same. So you got one CH3, a CH3, CH2, 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 CH2. A carbon oxygen remains the same. Carbon oxygen remains the same. Again, in this case, this is the only thing that changes. We insert the O there. So if we had something like this, and we put this through an oxidation. Again, the only thing that's gonna happen is right there. Everything else will remain the same. As we talked about with a lot of these reactions, you kind of have the answer right there in front of you. Absolutely nothing else changes. Everything remains the same all the way through. So I'm just literally copying what I have on the left-hand side down to my carbon oxygen double bond. And the only additional thing is I'm going to insert the O and that's going to give me my carboxylic acid group here. So these guys are super sort of easy to write the answer. Again, what you want to remember on all these sort of reactions is the part that changes. So in this particular case, if you have an aldehyde and you oxidize it, the only thing that changes is you stick an O in front of that H at the end and you get the carboxylic acid group. 100% of everything else in the molecule will remain the same. Any questions on that there? Now, if we try to oxidize a ketone, which is what this guy is, one, two, and three, again, try to put it through an oxidation, we actually will get no reaction. And again, here we will get no reaction because it is missing a hydrogen here. So this carbon does not have a hydrogen in this particular case. <clears throat> yeah, it, it should, uh, you, you, sh you would balance it, I think for our purposes um, in, in that particular case. I guess the answer to your question, you don't necessarily have to balance it because for us, we. We kind of only know this. 
in reality, there's some other stuff that's formed uh, that we really don't go into. Uh, sometimes it's hydroxide, sometimes it's like H3O plus and some other things that sort of make it balance in the end. So for us to answer your question, maybe a better way, no, you would just need to draw something like this. Even though technically speaking uh, to your question, there is an extra oxygen on the right-hand side. Um, there's, even though we, in this class, only think about this, there's actually a, some other stuff that's formed that's not really relevant for our purposes and it will kind of be balanced. So you don't have to put coefficients in front or anything like that, if that's what you're asking. <clears throat> So in this particular case, uh, we would get no reaction again because we are missing that hydrogen. So there's no hydrogen here. So it's unable to go through the oxidation. So remember, we saw that with our tertiary alcohol. So how we get to a ketone, right, is we take a tertiary alcohol. You know, something like this. And again, we... Uh, I'm sorry, I'm not a tertiary alcohol. Ugh. Secondary alcohol, that's how we get that. Try that again. That's more like it. That's how we get there. So it's a secondary alcohol gets us there when we oxidize it to a, uh, a ketone. That's not the same ketone you get, but you oxidize it to a ketone. Um, what I was trying to say there and kind of messed up there was a we saw it with a tertiary alcohol will not go through an oxidation again because it's missing that carbon hydrogen bond. So it doesn't have that carbon hydrogen bond. So uh, we will not see an oxidation occur. So it's very similar here uh, with our ketone. We will not see it oxidized because of that. And again, here's our tertiary alcohol. Again, this carbon is, is missing the hydrogen. So no hydrogen, so no oxidation will occur with this particular guy. Any questions on that? So because there's sort of a difference uh, between a aldehyde and a ketone in terms of an oxidation reaction, you could actually use that difference to determine whether or not you are starting with an aldehyde or starting with a ketone. And that is because here our aldehyde will oxidize and that oxygen will go in there, right there. And again, if you look at this, everything is identical to the left-hand side down to our carbon-oxygen double bond. Again, the only difference is we did that. So because our aldehyde will make a carboxylic acid and our ketone will not. There's actually two tests that are used sometimes uh, to identify whether or not this reaction is taking place. And one is the Tollens test. And in the Tollens test, we start with silver that has a plus one charge. And we end up with silver with no charge. So the silver gets reduced while our aldehyde gets oxidized. Remember, those things happen together. So if something gets oxidized, something will get reduced. And what we end up seeing is sometimes this is referred to as the mirror test, because as we form this solid silver in the test tube, it looks like a mirror pretty much, silver in color and stuff like that. So the Tollens test, if you do it, and the thing kind of turns this silver color, that is a positive that a carboxylic acid was formed and we started with an aldehyde. If you run this test on a ketone as you try to oxidize it, you will get no reaction and you will not see that silver form. And again, that would be an indication that you started with a ketone and not an aldehyde. Another test that is run is what is known as Benedict's test. And Benedict's test works kind of the same way. It uses copper two ions that gets reduced to copper one. Copper one is kind of a red orange type color. Copper two is a blue color. And same thing happens if you run the aldehyde and you oxidize it in the presence of Benedict's reagent the test tube will turn this reddish orange. And if it does, 
That means that the aldehyde was oxidized to a carboxylic acid. If you run it again on a ketone, you'll get no reaction and it will probably stay blue. It won't turn this orange or red color. And that would tell you that you started with a ketone. So these are two very common tests to help you decide whether or not you have a aldehyde or a ketone you started with. Tollens test turns kind of a silver color and that is positive for an aldehyde. If that test does not work, that means you did not have an aldehyde. You probably had a ketone. And the Benedict's test, which also works the same way. If it goes from blue to red or orange or a gross brown type color, sometimes depending, um, that is positive that you had an aldehyde that was oxidized to a carboxylic acid. And if you do it and it kind of stays blue, doesn't really turn that red orange color, that is negative for an aldehyde. And again, probably means you have a ketone you're dealing with. Question on those two tests. Now, before we wrap up this chapter, which is where we're at, there are a couple of reactions I do want to talk about. I'm just going to try to find a spot where I can write them. Uh, let's see. Right here, we'll just do it right here. This looks good. All right, so in addition, um, there are some reactions that occur between aldehydes and ketones and alcohols. So let's talk about what happens with those reactions. So first off, if we take an aldehyde and we add an alcohol to it, we get what is known as a hemiacetal. And if we take a hemiacetal and add another alcohol to it, we get what is known as an acetal. So let's talk about what's sort of happening here. So let's just start with a basic aldehyde here. So we'll draw an aldehyde. Nice kind of simple aldehyde here. And we're going to add just a nice, simple alcohol to it. We'll do methanol. So this is our aldehyde. And this is our alcohol. And what's going to happen in this particular case is a couple of things. There's going to be an addition reaction that's going to occur. And if you remember, addition reactions involve double bonds. And it's all gonna sort of happen right about there. And if you remember what happens when we do like an addition reaction is we make our double bond become a single bond and then we add two things in. So we saw that with alkenes, double bond becomes a single bond. We add a couple of things in. When we add the alcohol, the alcohol will add a certain way this first part it will break apart right here. So we're going to add an H and this oxygen carbon group will be added. So what essentially will happen is this entire thing on the left here, our aldehyde will look exactly the same. And we're gonna kind of do the same thing that we did with alkenes is we're gonna draw it exactly the same. The only difference is we're going to make that carbon oxygen bond into a single bond. And what is going to happen at this point is we've now made it into a single bond and that's going to allow room for the hydrogen to come to the top and this entire group to come to the carbon. So what ends up happening is we add an H to the O and where we made room on the carbon, it gets that oxygen carbon group. And this thing that I just made here is what is known as a hemiacetal. 
So what are the important parts of a hemiacetal? How do you recognize it? Well, it does have certain groups that are usually there. First off, when we look at the carbon, attached to this carbon is one OH group. Attached to this carbon is a oxygen carbon group, which would be this guy at the bottom, oxygen carbon. And thirdly, attached to it is a hydrogen, which would be this guy right here. So those are the three components of a hemiacetal. You have a carbon that has an OH group attached to it. You have that same carbon has an oxygen carbon group attached to it. And lastly, you have that carbon actually has a hydrogen attached to it. Now, when we add a second alcohol to this hemiacetal, So again, here we have our hemiacetal. We have again a second alcohol that's being added. Now, the same thing sort of happens, our very similar part happens. On the second part of this, it's almost like a substitution reaction happens. So what ends up happening in this case is kind of our alcohol still does sort of the same thing. It's kind of broken up just like this. And what ends up happening though is the hydrogen from the alcohol and this OH group. So this OH group here and this hydrogen, they actually come together. And if you just count up all the letters there, I have two hydrogens and an oxygen that is also known as water. And what ends up happening for the rest of this guy is everything stays the same. So we have H, C, H, H, C, H, O, C, H. So everything remains exactly the same. So all of this on the left is exactly the same. So if you're keeping track, we still have this part of the alcohol that hasn't ended up anywhere. And basically this guy comes in and takes its place. So where that OH comes off, the other part of the alcohol will come in and attach right here. And this guy that we have here is what is known as an acetal. And how do you know what an acetal is? Well, an acetal has two oxygen carbon groups. And what I mean by that is that is one and that is two. These oxygen carbon groups come from the alcohols that were added. There's one of them and there's the other one. They both come from the alcohols. It also has a hydrogen on that carbon and that's it. So this is sort of a two-step process starting with an aldehyde. You add one alcohol to it, you get a hemiacetal, which has an OH group. That's a good way to remember hemi, OH group oxygen carbon group and a hydrogen, add a second alcohol to it, water will come off and that second oxygen carbon group is added in and that gets us to a acetal. Any question on that one right there? Actually, it's, the question is, uh, does the second alcohol uh, here need to be the same as the first one. And the, the truthful answer is not necessarily. A lot of times it is. So a lot of times what will happen is uh, people will write the equation or you'll see the equation sort of written like, you know, you have your, al your aldehyde and then I'll go like, hey, plus, plus two of these guys. And if you were to do this with the two, it would take you all the way down to here, to the acetal. Um, but it doesn't actually necessarily have to be the same alcohol, but a lot of times it is. 
but it technically doesn't really have to. You can kind of switch it up as well. So, uh, but usually a lot of times the equation will be kind of the overall one. So they'll kind of do what I just wrote there on the bottom. And a lot of times it ends up being the same one, but definitely does not always have to be the same one. Other questions on that? So as sort of the question was, if you only add one alcohol, it will only take you to your hemiacetal. If you add two alcohols, it will take you all the way down to the acetal. Now ketones as well can do a similar reaction. And I can try to find somewhere I can screw that on. We'll go this way here. Uh, maybe I won't, I'll go this way. Open our page, we'll go here. So we could do a similar reaction with a ketone. And with a ketone, if you add one alcohol, you get something that's known as a hemiketal. And if you add a second alcohol to a hemiketal, you get something that is known as a ketal in this particular case. So let's take a look at how this one works. And it's very, very similar to what we just saw. So let's just start with a basic ketone. And let's just add an alcohol to it. And we'll make a different alcohol this time. So we're gonna add an alcohol here. So the first step is exactly the same as what happened with the aldehyde. It is gonna all happen right here. So we're going to get that addition reaction that occurs, which means just like what we did on the first one, we wanna draw this exactly the same. We just wanna make our carbon oxygen bond a single bond. So we'll do the exact same thing. We're going to make a single bond there and this. And just like what happened with our aldehyde, our alcohol is going to add the same way. It's going to be the OH. Uh, no, it's not. I'm going to draw it in the right spot. Take two. Sorry about that. Okay. It's going to be right there on this side of the OH would be good. And same thing is going to happen. The H is going to go to the oxygen. The oxygen carbon part will end up at the carbon. So what that means is we will add an H here and we will add that oxygen carbon part, which in this particular case looks like this. There's two carbons there without oxygen. And this is what is known as a hemiketal. So what is the difference between a hemiacetal and a hemiketal? Well, in a hemiketal, on this carbon, you still have an OH group. You still have a carbon oxygen group. I guess an oxygen carbon group is a better way of wearing that, oxygen carbon group. But the one thing that you don't have that you have in the hemiacetal is no hydrogen here. So no hydrogen on that guy. So if you remember our hemiacetal had a hydrogen there, our hemiketal does not have a hydrogen. Also, they are both called hemi when you have that OH group that's present. And just like our hemiacetal, if we take our hemiketal, and add one more alcohol to it. And again, we'll, we'll mix it up. Let's just say we added a, a different alcohol to it. We'll do this guy. The same thing's gonna happen as it did with the previous one. At this point, when you go to add this sort of second alcohol here, the OH group on our hemiketal and the H group on our alcohol, again, these guys are going to make water. So we will make that water. And then what is left is everything will be exactly the same. So we'll have a CH3, a C, a CH3, an O, CH2, CH3, 
And what is left is this guy here will now come in and take its place. And we will add that OCH3 there. And this gives us what is known as a ketal in this case. So if you add two alcohols to a ketone, you end up with a ketal. If you add two alcohols to an aldehyde, you end up with a acetal. What is the difference between a ketal and an acetal? In a ketal, you have two oxygen carbon groups and no hydrogen. So again, this guy has no hydrogen because it started out as a ketone. So those are two reactions that occur with aldehydes and ketones. Again, if you start with an aldehyde and add one alcohol, you get a hemiacetal. If you start with a ketone and add one alcohol, you get a hemiketal. If you start out with an aldehyde and add two alcohols, it takes you all the way down to an acetal. And if you add a ketone, two alcohols, you get a ketal. Any questions on any of those there? Okay, so that should wrap up uh, chapter 12 here. So we will continue on to 13. So give me a second to kind of get that up and running here. Okay, uh, so this is uh, go back to chapter 13, and uh, this is the last organic chapter here, so that's good. So we're going to pretty much cover everybody else that's involved, I think, that we haven't got to, so that should be some carboxylic acids. Uh, that will also be our nitrogen-containing groups, uh, amines, amides, and so forth. So let us start with uh, esters as well. Let's start with the carboxylic acid, uh, esters, amines, and amides. So we saw uh, carboxylic acid a minute ago. Uh, it has the functional group of carbon, oxygen, oxygen, hydrogen here. And again, that is oftentimes abbreviated COOH in terms of our carboxylic acid. And so sometimes in formulas, when you see that written, it is representing our carboxylic acid functional group here. <clears throat> and it's a very common sort of shorthand uh, that occurs uh, in formulas and stuff like that, that people very commonly will use. Now, when we look at our esters, which is another, uh, organic group. It has a carbon oxygen double bond followed by an oxygen to a carbon. So it's very similar to a carboxylic acid, but it's actually missing 
that hydrogen at the end, uh, it actually has another carbon group that is there. And um, that's what we can see here. These both have the carbon oxygen double bond group. So they still have that carbon L carbon that we saw here uh, earlier in the aldehydes and ketones. Again, just like in the aldehydes and ketones, that is also a polar group. So it does have this polar group. In fact, our carboxylic acid also has, as we will see, this OH group, uh, which is also polar as well. The other two sort of groups we're going to talk about are organic compounds uh, that basically contain nitrogen. Uh, this is amines. An amine basically has almost like an ammonia type group. So NH2 is typically an amine. And as we will see, this is very much like ammonia, which is NH3. So it has this sort of polar NH3 group, but it's not really NH3. It's usually more of an NH2 type group attached. And amides are carbon oxygen with that amine group attached. So it's got this carbon oxygen double bond and this NH2 group attached. And that's our amide in this typical case here. <clears throat> So these guys do have some different properties. Obviously, we're dealing with some nitrogens. We're dealing with some carbon oxygens as well. So let's start with our carboxylic acid and how we go about sort of naming our carboxylic acid. So not surprisingly, everything is pretty much named the same way. Uh, we're going to do the longest continuous carbon chain that has the carboxylic acid group. Now the carboxylic acid group, much like the aldehyde group, because it has this hydrogen, will always be at the end. So this group here will always be at the end of the molecule because of that hydrogen that's present. Um, and if we do our longest chain here, which is in the box, we have one, two, three, four, five, and six carbons. Six carbons is based off of hexane. And for our carboxylic acid, we end it with oic acid. So this is hexanoic acid in this particular case. Hexanoic acid for our six carbons that has that carboxylic acid group at the end. Now, although much like an aldehyde, because this group has to really be at the end of the molecule, we don't have to insert any type of number here. So we don't need any number with it. But this carbon oxygen double bond is always assumed to be carbon number one, which means, as you can see here, this would be one, this would be carbon two, carbon three, and a carbon four, five, and six. So a carbon four, we have a methyl group. A carbon five, we have a methyl group. And that's how we get to our name, 4,5-dimethylhexanoic acid in this particular case. Again, although you don't need to use it in the name of the carboxylic acid, this is always going to be carbon 1, wherever it is. So either on the right-hand side or the left-hand side. Any questions on that there? So very similar to you know, what we've seen before in terms of naming. Again, giving that the priority. There's a lot of carboxylic acids that have common names. Uh, this is actually one carbon with our carboxylic acid group. That would be known as methanoic acid, also known as formic acid. So that's like a very common name. This is one carbon, two carbons, which is based off of ethane. Carboxylic acid group there. This would be known as ethanoic acid. This is very commonly known as acetic acid and very commonly written like this. Here's our carboxylic acid in the formula, as you can see here, our COOH. Also, this is pretty much vinegar, right? So that's not very common. This is our benzene ring that has the carboxylic acid group attached, so benzoic acid. So these are very common names that are used a lot 
um, still here to this day. So for us, you should know formic acid and acetic acid is the same as methanoic acid and ethanoic acid. And I think probably 